So thank you very much for that very kind and unusual introduction. Um, I, I think Molly, our golden retriever, will be delighted. Uh, um, so it's a real pleasure to be uh, here with you today. Uh, and uh, it always seems strange to me to be talking about uh, psychological therapies uh, in Sweden because Sweden has, of course, contributed an enormous amount to the field and many of the cognitive behavioral treatments that are so influential worldwide were devised by Swedish researchers. So great pleasure to be here. It's a bit like, in England we'd say, it's a bit like bringing coals to Newcastle. Um, but let's see if we can create a bit of a fire together. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk to you about several things, but uh, how you develop effective psychological treatments and then how you ensure that they uh, have the impact that you hope they have, which is that they really help people with mental health problems. Um, and uh, getting it to people with mental health problems turns out to be not just a, a matter of science, it's also a matter of politics and economics, and I'll cover all of those in the talk. Um, so um, I think it's fair to say that over the last 20 to 30 years, there's been a real improvement in the prospects uh, for people with mental health problems. Enormous progress has been made in developing effective psychological therapies. Different countries have um, uh, clinical guidelines recommending evidence-based treatments, um, but they all support um, a range of psychological therapies. Uh, in uh, the UK, we have the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, or NICE, and that's um, charged by the government to impartially review the evidence for the effectiveness of um, interventions throughout medicine, and when it feels that there's overwhelming evidence for something, it will then issue um, a guideline when it feels there's overwhelming evidence that something doesn't work, it also issues a guideline saying don't do it. Um, and NICE recognizes um, evidence-based psychological treatments for depression, for all the different anxiety disorders, for uh, eating disorders and personality disorders, all as solo interventions. It also uh, recommends uh, them for schizophrenia uh, and uh, bipolar disorder in conjunction <coughs> with medication. So enormous progress has been made, but I think we're really on the cusp of a quantum leap forward in the field. And I think in the next 10 years, a lot more progress will be made. And I want to, by the end of the talk, explain why I think that. Um, so what are the sort of treatments that are currently uh, recommended because they're well supported by the evidence? Well, cognitive behavior therapy is a very prominent, but it's not the only uh, evidence-based psychological therapy. So this is NICE's recommendations. And you can see for moderate to severe depression, CBT is recommended, but on an equal basis, so is interpersonal psychotherapy. Um, for depression, CBT is personal psychotherapy, but also uh, couples therapy, brief psychodynamic therapy, and counseling all have some evidence base. Um, and um, Depression, of course, is a problem which people, even if they recover, often have a very big increased risk of relapsing in the future. It's a bit like a common cold, really. People call it the common cold of psychiatry. Um, and uh, as well as uh, CBT, mindfulness-based cognitive behavior therapy has been shown to be a good way of reducing uh, future risk of relapse. Uh, for the anxiety disorders, NICE is only recommending CBT, but not generic CBT, rather specialized forms of CBT for different conditions. Um, and for the eating disorders, again, it's interpersonal psychotherapy and CBT. In schiz schizophrenia, family therapy also has a strong evidence base. Um, so my plan for the talk is really to cover three things. Firstly, to talk about how you can develop new and effective treatments. This isn't discussed much in the literature. Um, so I thought you might find it interesting to know the particular template that our team has used to develop treatments. Uh, every group is slightly different, so I wouldn't say it's the only recipe, but it's one that's worked well for us. Um, and then I'm going to move on um, to the question of if you do develop an effective psychological treatment, um, how can you ensure that it gets to the public? And that turns out to be a very tricky problem. Um, when I didn't have gray hair, I thought that all you needed to do is work hard on your psychotherapy research and develop a new treatment and show it works and publish it, and then you can go off into the sunset and everyone else 
in the world will start getting this treatment and it'll have a big impact on people's lives. And this was the folly of youth, really. And I realized that this was the most stupid way of thinking about things uh, because it just doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen, of course, is that we have a very unlevel playing field. Um, the alternative interventions in uh, mental health are medications. And of course, they're developed by drug companies, which uh, if they put a lot of money into developing a drug and it's effective, they will then put an enormous amount of money into ensuring that it gets into the market. Um, but psychological treatment research is funded by research councils and charities that don't have much money and they uh, are desperate to fund the next new idea. So they have no money to ensure that the advances get into healthcare systems. And so um, researchers are left with the problem of how do you compete with a billion dollars of investment in drugs getting into the health service with no money at all? Um, so it's a bit of a challenge, but it is one that you can win, and I'll show you how a bit later on. Um, and then I'd like to say a little bit about where I think the f field is going in the future, which I think is really uh, very exciting. So first, developing psychological treatments. Um, our particular group has a, a strategy which is summarized on this slide, and we've used it to develop uh, the NICE recommended leading psychological treatments for three different anxiety disorders, social anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and um, uh, panic disorder. And we take a, a cognitive approach, uh, a cognitive therapy approach. So the first thing that we're interested in is identifying uh, the key cognitive abnormalities in a particular condition. What's the distinctive thinking style and what is it that maintains the distorted negative thinking uh, in that particular condition? So we develop a theory of the maintenance of the disorder um, and um, we then will test that theory in a series of laboratory experiments. Um, sometimes it needs to be refined on the basis of the experiments. But once we've got a theory that seems to work very well experimentally, then we will develop novel forms of psychological therapy that rather ruthlessly only target the processes in the model and ignore more or less everything else um, because we're looking for efficient interventions. Um, it takes a while to find the best procedures for changing the right processes, but once we've done that, we'll go on to do randomized control trials and dissemination studies. So that's the sort of plan. Um, I don't have time to um, uh, take you through all three of those disorders, but I'll say a little bit about uh, one of them as an illustration, social anxiety disorder. Um, this is the most common and persistent of all the anxiety disorders. Um, for most people, uh, if they develop it, they have it for the rest of their life. Um, and it has an uh, adult, an adolescent age of onset, so most people will develop it before the end of their teenage years. Um, it leads to marked disability and underachievement uh, in life. Um, people with social anxiety disorder uh, earn less, uh, they're less likely to get married, uh, they're less likely to get promoted at work, uh, they're less likely to have children, they have less people at their funerals. It blights the whole of your life. So it's very important that we can develop treatments that give people a new future if they can overcome their social anxiety. Um, when we became interested in the problem, the leading uh, therapy was actually a, a well-validated behavioral treatment exposure therapy and also forms of group cognitive behavior therapy. And they were doing quite well. Approximately 40% of people who would go through a course of treatment would recover. Um, but that's obviously a lot of people who don't fully recover. So we thought, could we improve on that? And we developed a new form of cognitive therapy that you'll see in a moment, which in many of our trials gets recovery rates around about 70%, so quite a big improvement. The numbers needed to treat are about two. Uh, statins, about 104, to give you an idea of the relative potency of these interventions. Um, and there's impressive evidence that it's superior to other psychological treatments. So what was the model that we used to develop these treatments? Well, this is one that Adrian Wells and I proposed in the mid-90s. 
And what we did is we um, interviewed a lot of people with social anxiety, tried to get into their heads, tried to understand what their beliefs are and why it was that they weren't persuaded by lots of evidence which seemed to contradict their beliefs. And we thought there were three key things that were happening. The first is to do with their attention. Um, what we found is that when people are in a social situation, they say they feel very self-conscious. So they may be talking to someone else, but they're not very aware of the other person. Instead, they're much more aware of themselves. They're constantly observing how they think they're coming across to other people. And that means, of course, that if the conversation goes well, they won't necessarily benefit from that observation because they won't necessarily have noticed it. Um, but it's worse than that because when they're focusing on themselves, they become aware of what we call internal information, um, which they take as very good evidence for their negative beliefs. Um, the most common thought of people with social anxiety is other people can see I'm anxious and they'll think I'm weird because of that. And if you ask patients, how do you know? Some of them say, well, people have said that. But mostly they say, well, people haven't commented on that. So if you then say, well, why do you think that? They say, well, I feel very anxious. And if I feel very anxious, I must look very anxious. So they're using their feelings to decide how they appear. Now that might seem logical, but actually there are lots of laboratory experiments that show your feelings are a very bad guide to how you appear. And in general, the more anxious we feel, the more we overestimate how anxious we look. So this focus on feelings is misleading people, uh, giving them the idea they come across much worse than they think. The second bit of information which turns out to be very important is mental imagery. People with social anxiety, when they're anxious, often have a, an image or a picture pop into their head. And the image is as though there's a video camera in the corner of the room, which it is over there, looking at them. And they see themselves from the perspective of the camera. But what they see is not the way they really look, but their fears visualized. So for example, um, one of my patients is a young teacher who is very worried that if she talked to the other teachers in the coffee room in the morning, they would think she was stupid. And so she would rarely speak. But when she started to speak, she'd feel tense around her lips. And that feeling of tension around her lips would be transformed into a mental image in which she would look like this. And if you ask her, what does that look like? She says, the village idiot. <laughs> so she doesn't need to check out from other people how she's perceived. She knows she's coming across badly because she can see it in her mind's eye. So these are two of the key processes which sort of lock people in a very un unpleasant, vicious circle. They're not paying much attention to other people. They're generating lots of negative images and feelings which they take as very good evidence that the worst thing is happening and they're coming across badly. But unfortunately it gets worse when you mention what we call safety behaviors. A safety behavior is something you do to try and prevent a feared outcome from occurring. So this teacher doesn't want you to think she's stupid. Her safety behavior is if she's talking to you, she will memorize everything she's already said to you and compare it with what she's about to say to you to check whether it's clever enough. And if she doesn't like it, she won't say it. Now, the consequence of this is that if the conversation goes okay, afterwards she'll think, I only got away with it because I did all this censoring. If I had just been myself, people would think I was stupid. So the basic fear persists. But it's even worse than that because if you're talking to her, it appears she's not interested in you. Um, and most of us, if we're talking to someone and they don't seem to be interested in us, we're a bit less friendly back. So this strategy actually makes people less friendly. 
even though she desperately wants to get to know you and be liked. Does that make sense? Okay. So these are the sort of processes that we observed. Um, we brought them all into the laboratory to test them, and we got very good experimental evidence for them all operating. And so we developed a rather specialized form of cognitive therapy which targets those processes. Um, and it starts actually with a, a, an exercise where you help people discover that focusing attention on themselves and doing their safety behaviors is unhelpful. And you get them to have a conversation with a stranger while self-focused and doing safety behaviors or shifting to an external focus. And they discover through their experience that their strategies are harmful rather than helpful. A big shock to them, but a useful discovery. And we then look at these distorted images that people have, and we use video feedback to compare how you think you look with how you really look on the video. And that turns out to be very powerful. Um, we then train people to shift their focus of attention away from themselves onto and onto other people. And then to test out their beliefs, um, for example, in the case of this teacher, by just saying the first thing that comes into her mind and observing other people rather than censoring the conversation. And that works very well. Um, some people, though, have been badly teased or bullied as children, and they have an element of sort of intrusive memories from those early experiences. And so we also use some techniques from uh, developed in, from PTSD from, for dealing with intrusive memories uh, to get rid of that problem. So that's the sort of uh, key ingredients of the therapy. Um, does it work? Well, um, there are quite a number of uh, trials now in different European countries. Um, and in direct comparisons in trials, it's been shown to be superior to group cognitive behavior therapy, exposure therapy, psychodynamic therapy, interpersonal psychotherapy, uh, medication, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, and uh, placebo medication. And there's also a uh, network meta-analysis which looks at all of the trials of different interventions in social anxiety and can draw some inferences about comparisons which may not have been directly done. And that infers that it's also superior to mindfulness. That's not a difficult ask because mindfulness is no better than no treatment for this condition. Uh, uh, supportive psychotherapy, uh, CBT self-help. Um, so we have a treatment here which, following this sort of strategy, is not only very effective, but is very good evidence for differential effectiveness compared to other psychotherapies. And that's what you're really aiming for in psychotherapy research, to show you've got something that goes well beyond a placebo, has specific effects. Um, and this slide gives you an idea of the sort of magnitude of the effects you can get. So this is our ver latest randomized control trial. It's 110 patients. And this is how severe their social anxiety is at the beginning of treatment on a well-known scale, the Leibovitz scale. The sort of clinical, non-clinical cutoff is here. So everyone's in the clinical range. They vary in severity from the moderate to the very severe. Um, and what I'm now going to do is show you what happens to that distribution uh, after people have gone through a course of cognitive therapy. You can see the whole distribution has moved down. Uh, the majority of people are in the non-clinical range. Um, these are very big effects. Um, but the treatments don't work for absolutely everyone. In this trial, we have three people that we didn't help at all. But the majority of people are at least <coughs> responding, and most of them are in the non-clinical range. So that's an example of the sort of potential that we now have for people with mental health problems that we didn't have 20 or 30 years ago. The problem is, in general, in most countries, the public simply doesn't benefit from this advance. Um, surveys uh, in many different countries have asked people, if you had a choice between a psychological treatment and a medication, would you have a preference if they both work? And of course, some people say, give me the drugs. But on a ratio of about three to one, people say, I'd like the psychological treatment. But in no Western country is that what you get. In all of our countries, you're much more likely to get medication. Um, 
in uh, the UK until recently, only 5% of adults with anxiety and depression had an evidence-based psychological therapy. And the problem was much worse for children and for people with psychosis. In the United States, it's getting worse and worse. Um, this is a, an example of uh, uh, the uh, percentage of people uh, with uh, depression who are being treated with antidepressants versus psychological therapies. And this is from 1987 uh, to 2007. So this is a period where there's great advances in psychological therapies, no advances in drug treatments. But the drugs are getting more and more of the market share and the psychotherapy is getting more effective and being given to less and less people. It really doesn't make sense, does it? So in England, we've had a go at trying to solve this problem. Uh, and we have what we call the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies program. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, the background for that, how it's developed, and where it's going. Um, it's a journey, and it's not finished yet, but it's moved as a long way uh, to realizing some of the mass public benefit that psychological therapies can achieve. So what is it? Well, it's an English program. That means that in the United Kingdom, uh, Scotland doesn't get it, Wales doesn't get it, and Northern Ireland doesn't get it. This is one of the disadvantages of devolved government. Um, and it aims to vastly increase the availability of evidence-based, and by this we mean what's recommended by NICE, um, the psychological therapies for depression and anxiety disorders, so the most common mental health problems. Um, and it took the point of view that our biggest impediment to people getting effective treatment was an absence of suitably trained therapists. So it aims to train a large number of psychological therapists and then deploy them in specialized services for anxiety and depression. Um, and, and this is really crucial, to measure and publicly report the clinical outcomes on everyone who's been treated. This is public money that's been used, and so it was felt very important to be able to see whether it really works. Not just it works in the research papers, but does it work on the ground in the healthcare system. Um, how did the program come about? Well, these big programs have lots of different routes. Um, the key thing was NICE issuing clinical guidelines saying that psychological therapies work. And then that allowed people to say, well, if they work, why aren't people getting them? Um, and a cru crucial bit of the lobbying was to bring together the economic argument for uh, psychological treatments as well as the clinical arguments. And so uh, this person here, uh, Richard Layard, is a very well-known uh, economist, and he and I got together to write a paper for, uh, it was uh, the Labour Administration, Tony Blair's government, uh, arguing that it would be um, save the country money as well as benefit people to make psychological treatments more widely available. Um, and uh, there was a, a concerted public lobbying campaign. Uh, we wrote um, a pamphlet called the uh, Depression Report, and we also uh, liaised with the mental health charities who produced their own pamphlet called We Need to Talk, giving similar arguments. Um, and uh, back in 2005, um, we got some initial political support for this initiative, initially from the Prime Minister at the time, uh, Gordon Brown. And then a national program was launched by a visionary uh, health minister, Alan Johnson. The program was then taken over by the next government, which was now a coalition, it's very unusual in, in England, of the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives. And here, are the, the two leaders of the coalition, David Cameron and Nick Clegg. And they were locked in a room for a couple of days and asked to sit down and see what they agree on in order to form a coalition. And very early on, on the first day, they said, we'll carry on and expand IAPT, which was great because they'd both put it in their election manifestos. Um, we now have another government, a conservative-only government, uh, uh, David Cameron, as you probably have noticed, has stepped down, and we have uh, Theresa May in charge, uh, but she is continuing to expand the program. So this is very unusual in uh, uh, public life, that you have a major social 
uh, policy, which is started by an administration on the left and is supported by a centrist administration and then a, a right administration, all of which are just expanding it. Um, that doesn't usually happen in politics. Um, and so it is extraordinary. And I think one reason for it, as you'll see, is because we're able to collect data on everyone and show that it's really achieving what it's meant to achieve. Um, if you're interested in trying something like this uh, in Sweden, we have written a little guidebook for you called Thrive, the Power of Psychological Therapies, which puts uh, in uh, the book all the arguments we used to persuade originally Gordon Brown, subsequently David Cameron, Theresa May, uh, Nick Clegg, uh, to expand psychological therapies. What were those arguments? Well, one of them was really just to point out um, how common uh, mental health problems are and um, to do it in a fairly straightforward way. So 38% of all of the uh, disability re related to illness uh, in Western countries is to do with mental health problems. Um, that is more than the disability to do with heart disease, stroke, cancer, lung disease and diabetes put together. So it is really a big player. What's even more important is it is the biggest player for the working age population. So this is World Health Organization data and this looks at the percentage of morbidity or disability due to mental health as a function of different ages. And you can see that for the working age population, um, around about half or just over of all disability is to do with mental health problems. Of course, that declines as we get older when cancer and cardiovascular disease get us all. But they tend to get most of us, thank goodness, when we've retired. So if you're asking the question, what health problem should we as a nation address if we want to grow our economy? The answer is, unambiguously, mental health. That is a health problem that will have the biggest beneficial effect on your economy if you tackle it. Much more than cardiovascular disease, much more than cancer. So World Health Organization figures uh, suggest that about untreated mental health problems uh, depress your GDP, your gross domestic product, by about 4%. This is a vast amount of money and money that doesn't need to be lost. Because as we've just seen, many of the most common mental health problems are very treatable. Um, this gives you a bit more of an idea of the economic cost. So depression is 50% more disabling than angina, asthma, arthritis, and diabetes. And mental health problems on their own account uh, in most Western countries for around about 40% of all disability payments that are paid out by the state and about 40% of absenteeism from the workplace. Um, and also a lot of what we call presenteeism. People with mental health problems, if they're at work, their mind is often somewhere else. It's on their worries. They're much less productive than if they weren't anxious or depressed. And that, on its own, is worth about 2% of GDP. So the costs, these are uh, UK costs, and so they're in pounds. If you want to convert them to Swedish krona, uh, you can multiply it by 10, and that roughly gives you the value. Um, so it would be 700 billion Swedish krona. Quite a lot of money. Um, and it's money that doesn't need to be lost, because uh, one of the arguments that Richard Layard and I pointed out in a paper in the National Economic Review was that the cost uh, of providing evidence-based psychological treatments is much smaller than the savings that are achieved by that provision. So we argued at the time that the gross cost of treating each person was about 650 pounds, 6,500 kroner. Uh, the savings to uh, our NHS uh, in physical health care were greater than that. Uh, and the savings to the government in terms of uh, reduction in 
state benefits, increase in tax revenues, again, were more than that. So this is a development which pays for itself twice over. So if you're in difficult economic times, it's stupid not to do it. It's just economic madness not to do it. So this argument was generally accepted, and we're in the process of a national plan for expanding uh, evidence-based psychological therapies. It started in 2008, and we now have the government committed to a, a full plan up to 2020. Um, that plan involves training over that period about 9,000 new psychological therapists and employing them in specialist mm -hmm. services. Um, the treatment that they will deliver will be in line with NICE guidance, so not just CBT, but also a range of other therapies when appropriate. Um, we have national training curricula uh, for each of the therapies, showing exactly what people need to be taught to deliver them effectively. And we have published sets of competencies of the particular skills you need to acquire to deliver them effectively. And everyone who goes through the course has their skills tested through observation of live videotapes. Um, and uh, when the program was uh, announced, um, uh, Alan Johnson, who announced it, the minister at the time, said its success will be determined not simply by how many people are treated, but by the clinical outcomes that are achieved. And he promised the nation that 50% of people would completely recover. And listening to that speech, I thought, Oh my God, having given him the 50% figure in the first place, I had some responsibility for it. But when you then realize you have to deliver it, it's, it's of course the right injunction, but it also is a bit scary. But it turns out to be possible, as you'll see. Um, and of course, if you're saying that you have to uh, get a certain number of people to recover, you have to measure it in everyone. So uh, the program involved a session-by-session session outcome measuring system. So each time someone's seen, they have a simple measure of their anxiety and depression. And so even if they drop out of therapy earlier than you might think, you still have a clinical outcome. You have the last time they were seen. Um, and uh, the aim was to move uh, to 15% of the prevalence of anxiety and depression in the community being treated uh, by 2015, and the government has just announced a further expansion to 25%. And the total investment is about 1.3 billion pounds so far. So what's it done? Well, I think it has transformed the treatment of anxiety and depression uh, in England. Uh, we now have a step care psychological therapy services established in every area. So NICE recommends for mild to moderate cases that a lot of people will respond with guided self-help or computerized CBT. And so often they're off offered that. If they recover, that's great. If not, they're stepped up to face-to-face -face therapy. And the more severe cases, they go straight to face-to-face -face therapy. Um, so we're now treating about, well, we're offering uh, assessments and guidance to about 900,000 people. Not everyone, it turns out, needs a full course of therapy, but we're treating about 500 and 40,000 people each year. And we get outcome data on 97% of those people. So in the last 12 months, we actually treated 543,600 people. And we have pre and post treatment measures of anxiety and depression on 97.6% of those people. This is unprecedented worldwide. It's very unusual in clinical trials. Um, and it's a consequence of this particular session-by-session session outcome monitoring system. But it does mean that um, you, when you've got the data, you can see whether you're delivering what you expect. But before I show you what we find, let me just persuade you why you do need to get data on everyone. Because many people would say, you know, if you get a bit of, mi bit of missing data, it doesn't really matter because it's random and you can just assume that the people who don't give you data will have done as well as the people who do give you data. And there's lots of statistics used in clinical trials which make exactly that assumption. Um, but we weren't sure about this, so early on in the program we decided to, to test it out. So um, 
in one area of uh, the country, um, everyone who was treated got the session by session measures, but they also got a more conventional measurement system where they were just um, given a questionnaire at the beginning of treatment and at the end of treatment. And on that conventional system, 50% of people failed to give you a post-treatment measure. They just sort of stopped at a different time, so the clinician didn't manage to get the measure. So we can now answer the question, if you have missing data, does it matter? Because, of course, we did know how much they'd improved with the session-by-session session one. And the answer is, it matters a lot. So um, in this slide, um, you have the amount of improvement people made in their depression and anxiety. If there was someone who on the conventional system, just pre and post measures, but nothing in between, give you data. Or if there's someone who on the conventional system, you tend to miss the post-treatment data. And you can see that those people in, who normally don't give you data have only improved 40% as much as those who do, gi do give you data. So we concluded we're deluding ourselves about how good our services are unless we get data on everyone. Because in general, the people who don't give you data will be the people who've done less well. So that's why we were so careful to get the data. What does it tell you? Well, the first thing to say is there are lots of headline figures you can do for it, lots of computations you can give. But the one that's discussed a lot in the media is what we call recovery. Um, and IAPT has an unusual measure for recovery. It says, we'll class you as recovered if you have dropped below the clinical threshold at the end of treatment on both depression and anxiety. Now, that's unusual. In most clinical trials, if, for example, you're treating depression, you say someone's recovered if they drop below the threshold on depression, but you don't look at the anxiety measure. If you're treating anxiety, you say they've dropped below the threshold on anxiety. But when you look at people, it turns out there's a lot of people, say in a drug study of depression, who are classified as recovered because they're below the threshold on the depression measure, who are still very anxious. So they're not really fully well. And we're treating people. We're not treating clinical syndromes. So we had the idea, we'll only count someone as recovered if they've dropped below the threshold across the board. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, of course, this is strict. Um, and if you look at data uh, sets, you find that uh, you get a recovery rate about 6 to 10 percentage points lower with this double recovery criteria than with a single one. So bear that in mind. But we're sticking with it because we think it's the right thing. So nationally, at this point, 49% of people meet that strict double recovery criteria. And a further 16% show what we call reliable improvement. So about two-thirds of people are showing worthwhile benefits. Um, and we divide the country into what we call clinical commissioning groups, little geographical areas. And 55% of them now have recovery rates of over 50%, and some of them now over 60%. So that, of course, tells you there's quite a lot of regional variability in the recovery that people get. And so one of the next focuses of the program is trying to understand that variability and, of course, reduce it so that everyone has a chance to recover at the rate of the services that are best performing. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we've discovered about that variability because it's something that I never dreamt of uh, when I started my career. I always thought that the only way to get better outcomes for people was to invent a new treatment that would be a bit better than the last. But we're now discovering that there are lots of other things that determine this variability, which if you can understand, you can manipulate. So what is the amount of variability? So average recovery rate, 49%, but the range is from 30 to just over 70%. Look at reliable improvement, 64%, but the range is from 24% to 73%. Psychological therapies can do harm as well as good. So it's important to also measure what we call reliable deterioration. Very rarely ever reported in the research literature, and even less regularly in routine clinical services. But we think it's important, so we assess it on everyone. Thankfully, it's got a rather low rate, 6% nationally, which is a lot less than if you put someone on a waiting list. 
So we don't think our services are harmful. But it's like the canary in the mine. It's a sort of warning signal. And you may find some services that have much higher rates. And we do indeed have some variability. There's one service at 13%, um, oh sorry, 11%, which is actually a statistical outlier. Um, there are other variables which I'll come back to in a minute uh, that show variability. So, um, what have we learned about the determinants of this variability in recovery? Um, well, we've learned some lessons from analyzing the national database. Some services have been doing innovation projects to try and change their recovery rates, and I'll tell you a bit about that. And we've learned a lot about the importance of clinical leadership um, and the value of public transparency uh, in mental health. So lessons from the national analysis. In, in the first year of the program, where it was still quite small, we have 211 services at the moment, but in the first year we only had 30. Um, we did some analyses looking at what are the correlates of uh, services that have high recovery rates or low recovery rates. Um, and what we found was those services that offered people a higher average number of sessions get higher recovery rates. So there's a sort of dose response effect, just like you would with medication. The average number of sessions that you need for a whole service to get the best recovery rates are not very large. It's about 10, but some services were much lower than that. Of course, you can have an average of 10, but some people have an awful lot more, and quite a lot of people have a lot less. Um, it seemed very important to use step care uh, properly. So all the services are step care ones. So you have some low intensity interventions, guided self-help, and some high intensity face-to-face -face therapy. But in some services, the people who provided them were different organizations. Right. And they saw it as a sort of comp competition. And they didn't want to pass people from one to another. So if you failed to respond to low intensity intervention, you didn't get stepped up. And those services got much lower overall recovery rates. So the patients didn't benefit. Um, it was very important, it turned out, when you're starting an initiative, you have lots of trainees. But it was very important that in every service, you have a core of fully trained, very experienced staff who can treat, even in the transition period, the most uh, disabled, most complex cases. And also, crucially, will allow the trainees to sit in on their therapy sessions and learn through modeling. And those services that didn't do those two things, the patients had much lower overall recovery rate. Um, it turned out to be important to follow nice guidance. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment because the result is still true. Um, and we also discovered that um, up until the IAP program in mental health in England, you could only get to see a specialist if your family doctor referred you. This was a way of controlling the costs of the health service. But we decided for IAP we would open it up to self-referral. And it turns out that people who self-refer, you know, just see um, the phone number of the service on the, the back of a till receipt in the supermarket, because we put them on till receipts in supermarkets. Um, those people were just as likely to recover as those who were referred by their family doctor, but recovered with less sessions. They'd gone on the website, they'd looked at what was involved in therapy, and they got the idea, and they'd already had a running start. Well, the most recent data that's been published is the seventh year, uh, and we now have um, a government body called the Health and Social um, Care Information Center, which um, processes all the data from IAP services. Every month, the data from the IT systems of every service is automatically uploaded to a data warehouse in the country, and the data is processed. Um, and so they, once a year, write a sort of very detailed report, uh, which shows you a lot more about the performance of IAP services. Um, and um, there's one coming out in October, uh, but this is really data from the last one, last October. The first thing is just to show you the sort of range of therapies that are available. So we have 211 services, and all of them are offering CBT. But 
Almost all of them are also offering counseling and many interpersonal psychotherapy. So the universal offer is CBT and counseling. But um, at least 75% of the services are offering at least three treatments so to promote choice among different therapies. Um, of course, which therapy you give depends on the clinical condition. That's NICE's recommendation. So in anxiety, it should only be CBT, but in depression, there's a range of therapies. But of course, many therapists like to ski off peace during their holidays, and when they come back from their holiday to work, they often think of skiing off piste again, um, thinking, well, I've got a lot of clinical experience. I know what I'm going to do with this patient, and it may not be consistent with the clinical guidelines, but that's my feeling, and that's what I'm going to do. The question is, do your patients benefit from you skiing off piste at work as well as in your holidays? And, of course, the IAP system produces a way of looking at that because we have quite a lot of skiing off piste, um, and so we can compare the patient outcomes when patients got a treatment that was not recommended by NICE with those where they got a treatment that is recommended by NICE. And the answer is it really matters for patients that you get the NICE recommended treatment. And here's some examples of it. So if you take uh, the low intensity, so the self-help treatments for depression, NICE recommends guided self-help. You have a therapist who keeps in regular contact with you, encourages you through the self-help materials or the internet materials. And there you get a recovery rate of about 50%. But if you just get the materials and no guide, you get a much lower recovery rate, 36%. Um, if we take generalized anxiety disorder, uh, NICE recommends cognitive behavior therapy, either in a face-to-face -face therapy format or for the milder cases, with guided self-help. It does not recommend counseling. But quite a lot of counseling has been given, and you can see patients suffer. So they have a lower recovery rate uh, for counseling than CBT or self-help with generalized anxiety disorder. But in depression, where counseling is recommended, they do just as well with counseling as with CBT. So it is important to follow the guidelines. Um, with a large database like this, you can, of course, look at other predictors of variability. And this is an analysis that I did for the conference that we're having here in Stockholm, the CBT conference. Um, uh, you could all do this. This is data that's in the public domain. You can download it from our website. Yeah. And I just looked at the, over the last year, the recovery rates for each of the IAP services and other indices that are published about those services. And have tried to predict in this case, variability in the reliable improvement rates. And you can see that, um, firstly, one good predictor is the extent to which the, your therapist identifies the problem that they're treating. <coughs> you might think this is a bit of an odd one. Um, but um, quite a number of clinicians feel that psychiatric diagnoses are evil and that you shouldn't really use them uh, and that the system isn't all that valid and there are fair debates about that. Um, and so the patient doesn't actually get what we call a problem descriptor, doesn't get their problem identified in terms of ICD-10 codes. So you're not saying, is it PTSD versus OCD, or is it PTSD versus uh, social anxiety? Okay. And for those services that have a low rate of problem descriptor identification, they have a lower reliable improvement rate so that patients are less likely to benefit. Presumably because they're less likely to get the nice recommended treatment because that's based on problem descriptors. Um, again, the average number of sessions is important. Those services that give a higher average number of sessions get higher overall improvement rates. How long a patient has to wait to start treatment is also important. If the service runs quite a long waiting list, then the recovery rates are lower. There's a sort of magic moment when people come forward for therapy and they're willing to work on that prob problem. And if you can't capitalize on that, then it's much more difficult to get going, we think. Um, some services, the way they're organized, you get quite a lot of people not turning up for sessions and it gets a bit chaotic. Again, they have lower overall recovery rates. Um, and then the percentage of patients who get a course of treatment rather than just an assessment 
is important. So some services only give a relatively small number of people a full course of treatment. Others, almost everyone gets it. And those services where m almost everyone gets treatment are the ones with the highest recovery rates for those people who get treated. They're services which are really focused on active treatment, not just assessment and guidance. Um, the last thing that we've looked at here is social deprivation of the area that you're uh, being treated in. Now, on its own, this is a, a multivariate analysis, but on its own, social deprivation is quite a good predictor of recovery rates. The more socially deprived the area, the lower the recovery rate. But there are different ways of thinking about social deprivation. One is, if you live in a very deprived place, there's not much that psychology can do for you. You've just got a bad life. The alternative is that if you live in a deprived place, then you're deprived of lots of things. And one of them may be quality psychological services. And so, in order to test that, you have to look at does social deprivation still predict when you take into account the indices of the quality of the service? And you can see that when you take into account all these variables, social deprivation no longer predicts. So it does seem that if you're in a deprived area, what's very important is you get a good quality psychological service. But then there is lots of hope. Um, this is the sort of predictive curves for those variables. Um, uh, the one I'll show you, though, is this one, average waiting time. So this is the number of days that people have waited before the start of treatment. And this is their recovery rates. And you can see that um, it, doesn't make, it doesn't matter so much if you're waiting for up to three weeks. But between three weeks and six weeks, each extra day that you're waiting is associated with quite a big reduction in your recovery rates. Um, and thereafter, you stay at this low level. That's all correlational data. That's all showing you things that predict better or worse overall outcomes for patients in a service. But you all know that correlation does not necessarily demonstrate causation. And so we've got to go beyond that. We've got to have some interventions where you take these sort of variables and you change them within a service and see whether you can change recovery rates. And Lots of services are doing this at the moment. But here's a nice example of that. So this is a, 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 a project done in one of the IAP services. Uh, it's a place called Buckinghamshire in England. And the clinical lead is a psychologist called John Pym. And this um, graph here shows percent recovery rates. Um, and the, the red line is the national target of 50%. And this service has three different areas that it covers. And those are the different colored lines but you can ignore the different colors because they're all showing the same pattern. So as you can see, at the start of this recording phase, which was uh, the end of 2013, the service is operating a bit below the national target, 45% recovery. What the service then does is for a one month period, they review every single patient who has been discharged who had not fully recovered. And they try and identify themes um, behind uh, those cases. They identify four or five themes and they then put in place a staff training program to address those themes. And you can see more or less immediately the recovery rates go up to the mid 60 percent and stay that way. This is a large service. It's treating five to six thousand people a year. If we had a new drug that moved that sort of number of people from 45% recovery to 65% recovery, you all should have bought shares in that company a long time ago. I mean, there has not been a drug development like that in psychiatry for the last several decades. But this change occurred with no extra investment, no change of staff, and no change of the therapies that have been delivered just the change in the way in which the whole system is organized. And this is magic to me. This shows you that there are some variables we've never dreamt of, which turn out to be incredibly powerful in changing the benefits that the public can get from our psychological treatments. So this is one of the wonders that you buy from getting routine data on everyone. You can learn things we would never have dreamt of. 
but it makes a very big difference. Um, another thing that we've learned is that clinical leadership is very important in these services. So um, a number of the services that performed very well were invited down to a workshop in London recently, and we asked them basically, what do you do? What's the knack? What's the trick? And it turned out that the, the clearest uh, thing was they had leaders of the services who are themselves very interested in recovery rates and improvement rates, not just how many people are seen, but whether they really get fully better. And the staff got detailed feedback in how they were all doing. Um, you might say, um, how's that done? And in most cases, you just get to hear what your recovery rate is for the patients you see, and then what the average is for the service. But in two of the services, actually, people get to know how everyone is doing in the service. And that surprised me a lot, but it turned out to be at the request of the clinicians. So they were told, we could do it, you know your recovery and then just the average, uh, and that's what we recommend, that's what most people do. But if you want it, we could do it for everyone. But then everyone in the team has to agree that that's what they want to do. And these two services voted for that because they wanted to talk to the people who are doing well with particular cases and then you know, try and learn from that. Now, I'm sure you all realize, as I say this, that you have to have a particular quality of leadership to create a system like this, don't you? Because it's so easy for data to be like Big Brother watching you and you feel that you're being criticized for your data or you're being scrutinized. And of course, the key is to create an environment in which everyone sees the data as something which is exciting and intriguing, which helps us all learn something together rather than punitive. And in order to make sure that really happens, all of these services put a very strong emphasis on providing all the clinicians with uh, regular continuing professional development opportunities, uh, opportunities to learn new things from workshops and other projects linked to the particular areas that they feel they should develop. And so each of these services, although very effective, seeing lots of people also give more time for professional development than most other services. Um, so the data tells you an awful lot, and for that reason we feel that it needs to be in the public domain. And so the IAP program is now a major exercise in public transparency about mental health. Um, there is a website, if you Google Common Mental Health Disorders Profiles Tool, then anyone in the world can look at the outcome data of every IAP service in England. Um, and when you go to that, you see a lot of information. So this is one view. This is different services, uh, different areas. And uh, this is the uh, treatment dose, so the average number of sessions that you get if you're a patient in each of those services. Uh, this one here, which will be difficult to read, gives the recovery rates for each different clinical condition. So if you've got PTSD, it shows you where the highest recovery rates are. Um, this shows, in a sense, the miracle of IAPT. This is paired data completeness. For a given service, how many patients had pre- and post-treatment measures? Uh, and you can see they're ordered from uh, highest to lowest as you go down here and here. Mm -hmm. And you can see in this area, the southeast of England, um, all of this page, there is no missing data. All of the patients treated in the previous year had a pre- and post-treatment score. But of course, it's not true everywhere. And the lowest performing service, 85% of people have a pre- and post-treatment score. But that was better than anywhere in the country before I am. Um, and this shows you the recovery rates and the variability that, that we talked about. The service that did that service innovation project is right up here near the top. It's now running at a 72% recovery rate. So that's where the program's got to so far. Where's it going to? Well, um, we're about to expand it again in this parliament, um, which runs up until tw 2020. The aim is to move from the roughly 15% of people with anxiety and depression are treated at the moment to 25%, so a big expansion. The expansion will focus on people, particularly with anxiety and depression, in the context of long-term physical health problems, such as diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, 
cancer with a reasonably positive prognosis. Um, and um, the reason for that is that these people tend not to be well served by our mental health services at the moment. Um, these management of your diabetes, management of your cardiovascular disease is done in one place, your mental health problem is done in another. And the two things aren't joined up together. And many people are too ill to go to all the different appointments. So we're going to create new IAP services which are co-located so you get your physical and mental health care in the same place with the physicians and the psychologists all working together as a single team. Um, and um, we will be measuring not only uh, obviously the psychological outcomes but also physical outcomes, so blood levels in diabetes for example, um, to uh, see how the whole person is benefiting from these interventions. And the argument for it, again, was an economic one. Um, if you have diabetes and you're depressed, uh, your diabetes costs 50% more to manage on its own. And we know from multiple randomized control trials that that excess cost can be more than, uh, is much greater than the cost of delivering the psychological therapy. So again, it pays for itself. It doesn't make sense not to treat someone as a whole individual and put it all together. So that's the plan. Another key bit, of course, is to mu you make much more use of digital platforms, internet-delivered therapies, for example, which allow you to get to a much wider range of people, often in their own homes. And of course, this is somewhere where Sweden has really been leading the world, and Per Kalbring will be giving a wonderful talk on that on Friday. Um, and um, this is an example of an internet website. This is our one on social anxiety. And we've found that uh, we can do about as well with internet delivered therapy with a therapist assisting you, but a lot of the learning on, on the internet as we could with the f traditional full face to face therapy. But it has the advantage that it requires only 20% as much therapist time for a similar outcome. So adding in internet delivery really helps us uh, realize the mass public benefit of psychological therapies. Uh, if you're going to reduce therapist time per patient by about 80%, still very skilled therapists supporting our treatments, but they're seeing many more people, of course, then for the money that we're spending currently to treat 15 to 20% of people, we could effectively treat almost everyone, which is a very big difference. Of course, patients have the benefit that they can access treatment at any time, anywhere. Most patients with anxiety and depression, when you ask them, when would you like to work on your problems, they say, evenings and weekends. Well, that's in general when our clinics are closed. But the internet is always open. And so, of course, they can work on things in their own time. And then the therapist can pick up on things the next morning and send them texts and things. So the internet really helps us move forward in terms of realizing mass public benefit. But I'd really like to end by saying I think it will help us move forward in another different way, and that is that it will help us make our face-to-face -face therapies as well as our internet therapies much more effective in the future. Why do I say that? Well, there aren't many examples of where you have one form of CBT which did pretty well, and then someone refined it into another form of CBT and showed that the refinement was better. We should have lots of examples of this because none of our CBTs are perfect. We've still got lots of people who don't respond. But it's very difficult for people to achieve that transition. And why is that? Well, one view is, of course, that the people who don't benefit will never benefit from a psychological treatment. But the other view is that face-to-face -face therapies and the way we do research on face-to-face -face therapies is just too noisy a system and the sample size are too small. So um, let me explain that. If you uh, look at what happens in face-to-face -face therapy sessions, including my own, um, and you watch the videotapes, you find 20 to 30% of each session is devoted to talking to the patient about what's happened in the last week. But psychotherapy is about learning new skills for developing, uh, for overcoming your emotional problems. And that what's happened in the last week isn't much to do with that. Also, therapists often have off days. You don't remember something quite as well as the day before. 
we are inconsistent in the way in which we deliver therapy. So if you think, well, there is a slightly different way of doing the therapy, which is I think will get better results, it's very difficult to ever show that in a trial because what you're comparing yourself against is a very noisy delivery. But the internet always delivers exactly the same thing. So from an experimental point of view, as an assessment of content, it's much better. It also gives you vastly greater sample sizes. So for our social anxiety program, we're in the middle of uh, starting to roll it out to tens of thousands of people and collecting all the data, which allows us to do what we call definitive <coughs> moderation analysis, where we really understand those people who don't benefit from the content we have at the moment, and then bring them into the lab, develop new content, and then randomize people online to the new versus the old with big samples and little noise variants. And to experimentalists, this is heaven. And so I think we're going to find that our treatments will get a lot more powerful as well as being distributed to many more people in the next decade. And so um, I'd like to thank you for your patience in listening. And maybe I should just say what in this journey of the IAPT, I feel have been the big lessons I've learned, just in case some of you want to try and do something similar in Sweden and see what are the things we painfully learned. Um, the first thing is it is incredibly important to have national guidelines about what works and what doesn't, preferably ones not linked to any particular professional group. And NICE has helped us enormously in England by doing that. Um, it is immensely important to get outcome data on everyone. Um, if you get support for something to expand psychological therapy prov provision, but you don't collect the outcome data, then the next time there's a change in commissioners, the next time there's a change in politicians, they will want to do something else because they won't know whether the last thing worked and so they'll always want something new. So it's very important to get the data and show that you're delivering what you intended to deliver. Um, it may seem unfair to us as clinicians, but it is immensely important to pay attention to economics. The argument that really launched the IAP program was an economic argument. But of course, once you've got the economics behind you, then of course everyone is also thrilled by the clinical benefits. But every health service is cash strapped, and so you have to show the economic components, the argument. Um, it's very important, I think, to bring patients with you. So we work very hard to recruit the support of patient groups, and you saw leaflets written by patient groups. So it wasn't just professionals arguing for something. You had the support of the people that we serve, people with mental health problems. Um, there are some radical ideas in IAPS. A lot of people weren't keen on collecting outcome data on everyone initially, and certainly not on publishing it. Um, and we took the view you shouldn't be forced to change your way of working. And instead, we thought we'd invite people to opt into the revolution. So we created new services, and people who'd like to work that way and experiment with that way joined us. But of course, when it turned out to be very successful, many people wanted to join. Um, it's important to deliver on time if you're looking at political support. Politicians have elections that they want to win. Uh, if they give support to a program, they're not very interested in you reporting the results after the next election. You've got to help them. And that means they've got timetables as well, and we have to respect them. Um, getting the clinical leadership right is incredibly important, and creating uh, an environment where people are inquisitive. It's an innovation environment rather than one where you feel like you're just following targets is vastly important. And the last thing I'd say is make sure you make lots of friends. Um, it's important in life in general, but if you're wanting to change public policy, there are two people who are particularly treasured as friends, and they are economists and politicians. And you may not all naturally gravitate towards them, but next time in your, you're in a bar and you see an eco economist or a politician, move that way. So, thank you.